Good evening from New York. I'm Chris Hayes. We begin tonight with a photo. It is a photo of one of the most powerful men in the country and one of the richest. That is Sam Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito in the center with hedge fund billionaire and Republican mega donor Paul Singer to his right on an Alaskan fishing trip they took together in July of 2008. The two men are beaming as they proudly show off their freshly caught king salmon, the largest salmon I've ever seen someone catch. The photo is the attention-grabbing centerpiece of a new pro-public investigation into the previously undisclosed relationship between Justice Alito and Paul Singer, who later had business before the court, cases from which Justice Alito did not recuse himself. ProPublica, of course, also recently revealed the various financial entanglements and gifts bestowed upon Justice Clarence Thomas by another ideologically committed right-wing billionaire, Harlan Crow. And now we know that Thomas is not alone in accepting lavish gifts and not reporting them as is legally required. The Alaskan trip was organized by another powerful member of the conservative elite, that guy there in the center, Le Leonard Leo, longtime head of the Federalist Society, who's in the green jacket with his own freshly caught fish. ProPublica reports that Leo invited Paul Singer to join the vacation and asked Singer if, you know, he and Alito could fly on the billionaire's jet. That flight, if chartered by the justice himself, would have cost in excess of $100,000 one way. Leo, Singer, and Alito stayed at a luxury fishing resort called the King Salmon Lodge that attracted celebrities and wealthy businessmen and charged over $1,000 a day. The lodge had its own planes and pilots who flew the guests 70 miles west to a river known for having one of the best salmon runs in the world. On another day, they flew to a waterfall in a national park where bears catch salmon from the water with their teeth. Most of us have to just watch that on the live stream. Sources told ProPublica, quote, at night, the lodge's chef served multi-course meals of Alaskan king crab legs or Kobe filet. On the last evening, a member of Alito's group bragged the wine they were drinking cost $1,000 a bottle. Now, Justice Alito never disclosed any of it and never recused himself from any of Singer's subsequent cases before his court. As one expert explained, quote, if you were good friends, what were you doing ruling on his case? And if you weren't good friends, what were you doing accepting this? Referring to the flight on the private jet. Now, Samuel Alito desperately tried to get ahead of this very story last night before the actual ProPublica article came out. Alito publishing an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, alleging that, quote, ProPublica misleads its readers, which is kind of funny because, well, no one had read the story yet. No one even knew it was coming out, except for the folks at ProPublica and Justice Alito, who ProPublica had asked for comment. The document that he published is an extremely bitter defensive prebuttal, arguing that Paul Singer is somehow neither a friend nor someone giving him a gift. Quote, my recollection is that I have spoken to Mr. Singer on no more than a handful of occasions, all of which, with the exception of small talk during a fishing trip 15 years ago, consisted of brief and casual comments at events attended by large groups. Alito goes on to downplay the luxuriousness of the resort where they stayed, calling it, and I like this turn of phrase, a comfortable but rustic facility where the meals were home-style affair. He claims to be unable to recall whether the group at the lodge was served wine, but if there was wine, it was certainly not wine that cost $1,000. Alito insists that there is no real way to quantify the value of the private jet flight on Paul Singer's private jet because, and I quote, Singer and others had already made arrangements to fly to Alaska when I was invited shortly before the event, and I was asked whether I would like to fly there in a seat that, as far as I am aware, would have otherwise been vacant. Well, that makes sense, right? Of course, that's why airlines allow you to just hop on board for free if they happen to have any open seats that would otherwise be vacant, right? Crucially, Justice Alito alleges there is no way he could have even known that Paul Singer was involved in the cases that came before the court. Quote, Singer was not listed as a party in any of the cases listed by ProPublica. Because his name did not appear in these filings, I was unaware of his connection with any of the listed entities, and I had no good reason to be aware of that. Well, I mean, you had Google, you had a bunch of really smart, high-performing law clerks who also could Google. I mean, this, this really is a tough one to believe, uh, particularly considering how much attention Singer's 2014 case against the nation of Argentina received. It was enormous news. He was trying to basically recoup money, right? As Reuters reporter Lawrence Hurley noted shortly after the story published, even his early reporting on the case before the court decided to hear it clearly named Singer and his company as key figures in the suit. 
And Paul Singer is not some obscure character. He's one of the wealthiest people in this country and a prominent donor in conservative politics. He even got a shout out at Donald Trump's very first press conference as president. Paul Singer just left. As you know, Paul was very much involved with the anti-Trump, or as they say, never Trump. And uh, Paul just left, and he's given us his total support. And it's all about unification. We're unifying the party, and hopefully we're going to be able to unify the country. So I want to thank Paul Singer for being here and for coming up to the office. He was a very strong opponent, and now he's a very strong ally. And I appreciate that. Now, this all comes in the wake of ProPublica's previous revelations about Clarence Thomas and billionaire Harlan Crow. And based on what we know so far, what's been reported, it seems that their justice billionaire relationship runs deeper than the ties between Sam Alito and Paul Singer. I mean, Harlan Crow, for example, took Clarence Thomas on several luxurious vacations over many years. He purchased the justice's mother's home, where he's now her landlord as she lives rent free. He even paid for Thomas's grandnephew's private school tuition. But there's a commonality here. Both relationships do have the same contours. Crucially, Leonard Leo, head of the Federalist Society. Oh, there he is again. He's a common thread. He's pictured here. Remember this, this painting of Crow and Thomas and the rest hanging out? He's the second from the left in this painting, depicting one of Thomas's many visits to Crow's upstate New York resort. And both stories involve ritzy, glamorous gifts from right-wing billionaires with enormous, obvious ideological and, in some cases, material interests before the court. It is obvious, apparent to everyone that these relationships, trips such as these, are a form of soft lobbying, a form of influence peddling. Anyone with any sense, don't even have to be a lawyer, but as Supreme Court justice should have, would understand that. Why are they taking me on this lavish trip to go fish for King Salmon? Well, me? You would understand that and you either would not go along with it or at a minimum you would disclose it. Once again, we know that is not happening here because these justices view themselves, apparently at least, as existing above the law and certainly above the norms and rules that guide the other members of the federal judiciary. That will likely remain the case. I mean, you know, what are we going to do? <laughs> Unless outside forces like Congress begin to impose real restrictions, and they might be able to. One of the most outspoken congressional critics of these ethical violations, Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois, chair of the Judiciary Committee, has largely deferred to the court of the police himself. But after this article, he gave perhaps his strongest condemnation yet in response to the new report. Let me state the obvious. There's something rotten going on in the Supreme Court of the United States of America. The defense offered by Justice Alito is laughable. Laughable. I took that seat on the uh, jet plane and didn't feel like I had to report it because it was going to be empty anyway. Give me a break. There is no reason why the highest court in our land should have the lowest ethics in our government. One of the few rules the justices do have to follow is the yearly publication of their financial disclosure forms. Although, of course, as we've been learning, they often leave things out. We are still waiting on those disclosures from both Justice Alito and Justice Thomas, who, interestingly enough, have received 90-day extensions. One of the worst infrastructure disasters in years, a tanker truck carrying 8,500 gallons of gasoline overturned underneath an I-95 overpass in Philadelphia 10 days ago. The truck caught on fire, killing a driver and destroying the overpass entirely. Now, this is one of the most critical interstate corridors in the country, stretching from the Canadian border with Maine down to Miami. Millions and millions of people up and down the eastern seaboard rely on it. And more than 160,000 vehicles normally travel over just that one section of I-95 in northeast Philly every day. The damage from the fire was so extensive, an entire section of the road collapsed, and local residents worried it would take months to fix. I do construction for a construction company up in Doylestown, and I'm up and down 95 all day long, all the time. Chris Corning predicts his commute will now take an hour longer every day. How much early I'm going to have to leave? And, and, my, and my girlfriend, how much early is she going to have to leave? Because the boulevard is going to be crazy. But the new governor of Pennsylvania was determined to get the freeway rebuilt as quickly as possible. Josh Shapiro issued a disaster declaration last week, allowing repairs to be accelerated and releasing $7 million in state funds. Plus, he has the backing of the federal government, which is expected to cover the repair costs, estimated to top out around $30 million. 
union crews have been working 24 hours a day in 12 hour shifts. And amazingly, they have already nearly completed a temporary road web. It's filled in with an aggregate material made from recycled glass from a company in nearby Delaware County, which means the interstate could now be open by the end of the week. Based on the tremendous progress that we have made over the last 72 hours and the time it takes to complete the remaining steps, I can confidently state right here, right now, the traffic will be flowing here on I-95 this weekend. This weekend. That's incredibly fast. Just to put this in perspective, when something similar happened in Atlanta in 2017, a section of I-85 collapsed after a fire, it took a month and a half to get the road open. But this repair in Philadelphia will take just two weeks, a third of the time. And it's one of those things that are just good on both the politics and the substance. Governor Shapiro put himself out there, promised to put the full weight of the government behind the rebuild, and sure looks like he delivered to the gratitude of the residents who depend on that interstate every day. In fact, the live stream of the construction project is so popular in Philadelphia right now, the Phillies even put it up on the scoreboard during last night's game. It all shows you can do big infrastructure projects with the right political will. It also makes for, well, great politics. We're showing the rest of the country that Philly and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, we're tough. We're showing them what we are all about. We're showing them our grit and our resilience. This is what it looks like when the ingenuity of Delco meets the grit of Philly and we work together to get it done. Tonight's party line vote by Republicans to censure a colleague who led the first impeachment of the ex-president and expressed his belief that it was likely that Trump had in fact colluded with Russia is just another example of how the right wing tries to chip away at the truth until they have sculpted a lie into stone. They tried to do it the 2020 election. They've really tried to do it and had some success with COVID lockdowns. Oh, they were a failure. Oh, they were necessary. And they have tried to do it and had some success with the Mueller investigation into Russian sabotage of the 2016 election. As part of that effort, the House Judiciary Committee heard testimony from, as we mentioned, John Durham this morning, the special counsel appointed under Donald Trump to investigate the people who tried to investigate what Russia did in that election. But Congressman Ted Lieu, Democrat of California, was having none of it. Okay. Now, Mr. Durham, I'd like to ask you the following simple yes or no questions. Trump's former campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, was convicted, correct? I'm sorry, could you just repeat yeah, that? Trump's one? former campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, was convicted, correct? That's correct. Not Trump's former foreign policy matters. advisor to the campaign, George Papadopoulos, was convicted, correct? That's correct. Trump's former deputy campaign manager, Rick Gates, was convicted, correct? Not in connection with the it's Russian Trump's. Matter. All right. Mr. Durham, you can hold yourself out as an objective Department of Justice official or as a partisan hack. And the more that you try to spin the facts and not answer my questions, you sound like the latter. So I'm just going to ask this simply. Trump's former national security advisor, Michael Flynn, was convicted, correct? That's correct. Trump's longtime advisor, Roger Stone, was convicted, correct? I'm sorry, missed the last Trump's thing Trump's longtime advisor, Roger Stone, was convicted, correct? Correct. In contrast to multiple Trump associates who were convicted, you brought two cases of jury trial based on this investigation, and you lost both. And so I don't actually know what we're doing here, because the author of the Durham report concedes that the FBI had enough information to investigate. And thank goodness the FBI did, because multiple Trump associates who committed crimes were held accountable. And the best way to summarize what happened is thank you to the brave men and women of the FBI for doing their jobs. And Congressman Liu joins me now. Um, Congressman, what, what was your understanding of the purpose of today's hearing, Mr. Durham? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chris, for your question. Let me first say, when Democrats control the House, we pass laws like the infrastructure law to help American families to grow our economy. And when Republicans control, what do we get? We get stupid stuff like this dumb hearing on a Durham report, which concluded after wasting $6 million of taxpayers' money that the FBI had a duty to investigate allegations of trump Russia collusion. And thank goodness the FBI did that because multiple Trump associates were convicted and held accountable for their crimes. One of the, the themes today was frustration from Republicans, right? Yeah. The, the, the Durham's investigation, his report, and the two cases he brought, which you referenced, both of which uh, ended in acquittals, quite notably. Uh, 
didn't come up with more. Matt Gates tweeting Durham is part of the cover up and then uh, telling Durham to his face he was like the Washington generals. Uh, take a look at this this exchange. You didn't charge Andrew McCabe. You didn't convict the lion Democrats or the lion Russians. You didn't investigate Mifsud or the Mueller probe, even though, as we sit here today in black letter, that was your charge. Have you ever heard of the Washington generals? The Washington generals? Yes. Yeah. And, and they're the team that basically gets paid to show up and lose, right? <laughs> um, what do you take away from the frustration of folks like Gates and others with Durham and what Durham produced? MAGA Republicans are trying to rewrite history, and we cannot let them. The facts are very clear. The Department of Justice, through the Mueller report, found that the Russians interfered in our elections in 2016 in a sweeping and systematic fashion. A bipartisan U.S. Senate report in 2020 concluded the Russians interfered, and it was designed to benefit Donald Trump. And then Paul Manafort, Trump's campaign chairman, admitted that he gave internal Trump campaign data to the Russians. Uh, that is called Russian collusion. It was interesting to me to watch the basic facts of that be reset, because I do think it's been, even though the Durham report I don't think has been particularly effective, I do think William Barr's massaging of the report, his control of its release, was relatively effective in obscuring a bit of just the depths of what was found by the Senate Intelligence Committee by Mueller, which is basically, I think, you know, not debated, right? The sweep of the Russian effort to tip the election, the obvious openness on the part of the Trump campaign, the welcoming of that help both publicly and privately really through the sun, and the actual sort of two fingers touching in the giving of that information to Konstantin Kalimnik, who is uh, assessed to be an asset of, of Russian intelligence. Do you think they've been successful in rewriting that history? I do not. Uh, we do know that the American public rose up and fired Donald Trump. And I think part of it is people were concerned about his ties to Russia and his campaign's ties to Russia. And what we see now with this indictment of Donald Trump from Department of Justice is that he also had all these classified documents. And why would he keep these top secret documents and not give them back? Uh, it's all very suspicious. Adam Schiff today was censured along party line votes. Um, what is your assessment of the full day, starting with Durham, ending in that censure vote, and why they chose to make him, I believe, the third member censured this century yeah. in, a, in a body that has seen multiple felons and currently includes right. George Santos? Right. So, again, how does this move the American family forward? How does this grow our economy? I note that the author of this censor resolution, Representative Luna, has introduced a total of six bills in her entire career. Five of them are about Adam Schiff. That's rather, <laughs> that's rather obsessive. And this strange obsession that the Republicans have with doing stupid stuff, none of this is helping grow our economy or moving the American family forward.